I did present this, uh, this talk the first time at uh, the Europe Python conference, uh, but by then it didn't actually change a lot. So if you want to see a version online on your laptop, uh, you can go to the bit.ly link. I'm going to show it to you. This one, which is bit.ly uh, slash tf2 uh, hyphen strikes back. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone who came along this morning. Uh, we might actually show that uh, bitly link again, so people seem to be really interested in it. So okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, what was it on? Can you see? Yep. Yeah. Uh, can everyone see that? Uh, so thank you very much for coming along this morning. Uh, I'm really excited about this talk. We're going to learn about what's happening next in TensorFlow from uh, Mikhail here. Uh, so without me going on too much, uh, thank you very much for coming along, and hopefully we all come out of this with, well, I'm sure we will come out of this with, Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna switch to the to, to the slides. So if you, everyone has their, their Bitly, uh, I'm not sure how it how does it look on mobile, but on uh, on laptop it works fine. So, okay, uh, welcome to my talk. Uh, this talk will be on TensorFlow 2.0 and everything which is new since uh, TensorFlow uh, 2.0 has just been released like uh, maybe last week. So this is all pretty new stuff, even though it has been out there for months now. So uh, this will be a 40 minutes overview of everything that you need to know to get uh, you know, uh, your feet wet with, uh, with TensorFlow. So a quick, uh, quick word about me. I am Michele De Simoni. Uh, I come from Italy. I work as a machine learning engineer and researcher at uh, Zurutech. Uh, Zurutech is uh, actually a spin-off from a Chinese uh, toy company. And, but uh, as I said, the, we, uh, we are doing some cool stuff with the AI and machine learning, especially on, the, uh, on computer vision and GANs. Uh, if you go to my website, you will see that uh, we have been publishing uh, uh, some papers on uh, GANs and normal detection and stuff like that. I also work as a freelancer uh, sometime, whenever I have time, as a trainer for, for Python or as a machine learning consultant. Uh, I'm also the founder and organizer of the PyData chapter for the Emilia-Romagna region in Italy, and also I'm a manager of the Google Developer Group in Bologna. Uh, if you want to reach me for, for anything like question on maybe how to get started with Python or TensorFlow and everything like that, you can reach me on my, on my either my GitHub, my, my Twitter, everything. Uh, these are some of my, some of my website, uh, mostly divided between uh, stuff I do like professionally and stuff uh, which I do like m most like random thoughts on conference and stuff like that. So here we go, TensorFlow 1.x. How many of you uh, have tried their hand at uh, TensorFlow? Okay. How many of you enjoyed this, <laughs> the experience of TensorFlow 1.0? Point, or? Yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly. How many of you did try PyTorch? Okay. How many of you did try Keras? Okay. If you like Keras and PyTorch, you'll probably fall in love with TensorFlow Supernova. You will see uh, there's quite a lot of stuff that uh, changed it. So, uh, why was TensorFlow so cool? TensorFlow 1.0 was like revolutionary in the field because it was the, the big, uh, like the very first big framework. Uh, before it, we, we had Teano, but Teano was uh, maybe, you know, like out of the research. Uh, it came from the academia. TensorFlow came from the hand uh, of the Google engineer, so it was as uh, all of the, like Google product, uh, very complex to use, but also like extremely powerful. The idea behind TensorFlow, especially the 1.0, was that uh, uh, TensorFlow in itself is a C++ library, and what we use when we are in Python is just like a, an API and a wrapper around it, um, much like what we do with, with NumPy and the other numerical libraries in Python. Uh, so it had amazing performance. Uh, it was one of the first framework which we were able to, to scale with tons of GPU and uh, like the deployment story and the production story of TensorFlow was amazing and it still is. And it's probably one of the reasons why sh you should look at TensorFlow even today. Uh, it was very easy to deploy, especially at massive scale. And it also had this, uh, this idea of a static graph, which was that uh, you, you are not using Python. And as we will see, this is also was one of the major drawbacks 
uh, Python was used uh, not as a language per se, but mostly as a descriptive way of creating computational graph that uh, later on you will have to run it. But one of the cool things about uh, the, the idea of a static graph is that, is that once you have the, this graph representation of your computation, then you can export it. And for instance, uh, this is why it was so easy to like serve it in production or put it on mobile and everything like that. Because uh, basically, like the static, uh, the graph itself, if I remember correctly, once you save it to to the like to to your disk, uh, it was saved on uh, uh, via portable file. I may be wrong, but uh, I remember like that, and it's it's all even today. And so portable file is a way to like pass a message, and uh, you know it's basically like you can work it with uh, any language. So you could like uh, train your model in Python, then serve it with C plus plus or Go or even Haskell, Rust, or whatever. Uh, and also. Uh, by the end of last year, I think, if I'm correct, it was like 2018, something like that. Uh, they added the, now it was like at the beginning of the uh, of last year. So they added the, the tf.data package, which is a, uh, a very high performance uh, input pipeline for your model and the training special of your model. Uh, this package uh, came from the, the need uh, they had at uh, Google to basically leverage their new TPU, which is like this sort of GPU on steroids. Uh, for training. Uh, the problem was that uh, even though they had like this uh, amazing dedicated hardware, they were able to um, like use it completely because their pipeline were able to keep up with the power uh, of their model. And so they, they created this uh, actually really easy to use uh, pipeline which actually like scale especially well when you have to train on sort of like you know very large scale data set or like very large scale model. So however as I, tell, as I said, that this came in a, uh, this phenomenal computational power came in a very ugly and clunky API. Because uh, yes, you were using TensorFlow as a Python package, but you were not really writing Python. I mean, it was Python, but it was not Pythonic in the sense that uh, everything about it, uh, about how you use TensorFlow was completely different than uh, uh, what we used to do in Python. Most likely uh, due to the nature that, uh, as I told you, Python will use it mostly as a descriptive way of describing uh, computational operation, which were not even executed as is in a, what is called like eager mode. So like you you define your computation, you run it like line by line, but you had to first define your graph and then in a session run your graph. Uh, this is coupled with uh, some stuff, for instance, that the variable uh, were actually like stored in a sort of global scale, uh, global scope and they were not going away. There was no sort of garbage collector uh, for variables that uh, you were using in, uh, in TensorFlow, so you had to manually uh, keep track of them because uh, otherwise they were like living uh, forever and you had to retrieve them and there was like this uh, uh, syntax which was like the get variable scope and everything like that. So it was not really easy to, to get into and uh, it often uh, came down with uh, this very verbose, uh, not even Pythonic uh, uh, way of like writing on the, uh, your model. And so the, the community uh, was basically split when uh, PyTorch came along, because PyTorch uh, was the first uh, true network with uh, a proper eager mode. And PyTorch was like amazing at the time, because uh, it came in a moment where a lot of people were frustrated by TensorFlow, but they, they didn't have any other choices. And what PyTorch offered was these uh, uh, very uh, easy to use streamlined API, very Pythonic. Uh, the graph was not static, but you, the graph was, the computational graph was defined whenever you were running your operation. And uh, this meant that uh, uh, it was much easier to use, and that's why there was like this huge uptake, especially in the academia for PyTorch, uh, but uh, we don't see the same thing in the industries. Because uh, uh, actually uh, the problem with this approach was that uh, without the static graph, the, usually the, the serving part of PyTorch was uh, a pain. Uh, and that's why the, there is like this dichotomy between academia and industry when it comes down to framework. Uh, one of, uh, as you see, the, there's also the, one of the other problems with TensorFlow was the, the mess that was the tf.contrib package. Uh, which was actually a module inside TensorFlow where everything cutting edge, experimental, uh, went in. The problem is that it was part of the main package. So every time you update your TensorFlow, you, you install TensorFlow, you were also pulling this uh, contrib stuff, which was like maybe some, some API were redundant, some were like completely experimental, maybe they, they broke. Uh, so it, it was really a mess. Uh, and so, but things have changed. 
Uh, this is uh, some, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe it's uh, uh, too small to read on the big screen, but uh, this is a joke. It's a green text like the one that you can find on board like 4chan, something like that, which uh, describes the, uh, what, what was the life of a machine learning engineer back in the day, which was like, yes, we are, we are working with the TensorFlow, everything, uh, okay, it's hard, but we don't have any other choices, we can put in progression, we are happy. Then PyTorch comes along, you start looking at PyTorch and you're like, oh God, maybe I, I have to, to actually like make the switch because it's so nice and so easy. But then you decide to wait because uh, the default at TensorFlow announced that uh, they will be supporting eager mode, as we will see later on, which has actually uh, has become one of the, like, the, the major milestone uh, selling point of a TensorFlow 2.0. Uh, the problem was that uh, at the time, like last summer, when they announced the ETF figure mode, it, it was a mess. It was like full of bug and didn't really work. And so you were like stuck wondering, maybe I should I really like switch to PyTorch and then September comes in, PyTorch announces <laughs> PyTorch 1.0 and you look at all the amazing stuff they're doing, you see your TensorFlow code and you're like, geez, maybe I really, really needed to, <laughs> to have done the switch, you start panicking. Uh, but then like the, the development pace for like the features of uh, TF 2.0 starts like getting really underway and actually like bugs uh, become, you know, they, they get ironed out and everything become usable. Uh, in our shops at Zurotech, we, we actually uh, went uh, straight in from the first moment they decided to, that, uh, yes, you could use uh, eager mode. Uh, we were like one of the, the few shop in the like so-called like very early alpha stage of TensorFlow 2.0, so we have seen all the history of the bugs and uh, everything that broke. Uh, but, but then, luckily, came the spring, and with the TensorFlow Dev Summit of this year, uh, there was like the first established uh, version of uh, TF uh, uh, 2.0, and then luckily now in September it is actually has been fully released, and it's actually like an amazing piece of software in my opinion. So here's the new TensorFlow. As you see, the logo has become sleeker, you know, uh, much less uh, uh, shell. Uh, and more like sleek and modern, and so the same thing happened to the to the API. Since I will be, uh, what we show you now is like the all these new streamlined API. So you either die a static graph or you link long, long enough to become eager by default. So yeah, static graph are gone, but not really. Uh, they're actually gone into hiding. So by default now, the code you write in TensorFlow is eager mode. What mean eager mode? Let's see in the world of the documentation. TensorFlow Eager Execution is an imperative programming environment that evaluates operation immediately without building graph, operation returning concrete values instead of constructing computational graph to run later. So gone are the need to do like, uh, the, like the scope and the graph and then run the graph in a session. Uh, now you, you write Python, you execute stuff, and actually you have value. So b before this, uh, what you have to do, for instance, let's say you wanted to simply like add uh, uh, one and one. Okay, so you had like a tensor with the 1.0 uh, uh, and then a tensor with the 1.0. You add them together. In uh, what happens in uh, before 2.0 was that uh, you don't actually get a tensor with a 2.0 in the in the value, but you get a tensor operation, which when you run it and you evaluate it in a session will yield the, the correct value. Now, if you sum together two, two tensors, they actually output the sum of the two tensors. So you don't need to have this, uh, this passage anymore. Uh, so um, the problem was also that the one of the the, the stuff that you had to do uh, when working with the graph is that you couldn't use the normal Python uh, control flow. So for instance, if you wanted to do if for uh, anything like while, you had to not use the, the Python one, but you had to actually use and work with the one provided by, by TensorFlow. Uh, now the, this needs uh, is uh, mostly gone. Uh, even though there are some caveats still, uh, mostly due if you want to maximize your performance. Uh, but then you basically can uh, write your Python and there is this uh, uh, magic decorator, which is called the function, which underneath uses something called autograph, which I will talk about briefly uh, later, uh, which turns your Python code into, uh, if you want to, it turns you into like a, a machine written uh, graph code and you, you, which you can execute in a graph, uh, uh, graph context as, a, as before, but without, it's automatically, automatically converted and run as a graph, so you don't need to write any uh, additional boilerplate other than putting the, the decorator, uh, and you get actually a, a huge boost in performance. 
So now we can uh, uh, write and debug Python code because uh, even like the debug history with the TensorFlow 1.x was like a mess. Now in 2.0 you, you can debug it as you know regular Python debugging. So yay. Also has the Vista Globals. Uh, like as I told you before 2.0 uh, there was this problem where like um, stuff you define variables uh, uh, were like put in this sort of uh, global scope uh, and uh, you had to uh, like they were like immortal in the sense that there was no sort of garbage collector that came in and like swoop, swoop up everything that you, you don't need to. Uh, now, in a, I think a decision of you know, like environmental friendliness, uh, the team uh, TensorFlow, they, in these uh, uh, variables 2.0 RFC, they decided that uh, they will uh, uh, recycle the variable. So th there, there is now a sort of garbage collector which uh, comes in and everything that you lose track, it, like uh, you, you use, you know, you, you lose uh, your pointers to will become like deleted. Uh, so you have now to manually be, you know, like uh, aware of the variable that you have in your scope and track them. But this is not actually like uh, much of an overhead because uh, uh, it's pretty easy to do manually. It's not a problem. It's like what we usually, you know, like do. And, and also like the if you use Keras, which is now become the default API, everything has been done for you, so you don't have to manually track anything. And also, no longer add the need for like get variable scope and stuff like that. This is gone. No more like that. So also, make function, not session. So as I told you, session are gone. There are no like DTF session and stuff like that. But every function now can become a session in itself. As I told you, there is this new beautiful decorator, which is df.function, which is built on top autograph, which is uh, this uh, uh, like suite of uh, Amazing engineer, which trace your Python code and convert it to uh, like a graph representation, which is uh, optimized for, for performance. Uh, but but you don't see anything like that unless you want to, because you can get the uh, like your code, like you can get the output of the, this conversion, which is a, of course code which is almost unreadable because it's machine generated. Uh, but what is cool about it is that you can, for instance, like define your, I don't know, like a training loop, uh, as you will see later on in the custom training loop, as a like simple for loop iterating over a data set and then doing your computation. Then you slap on it this, uh, uh, this TF, de uh, TF function decorator and everything inside that function uh, will actually be converted to a graph and then executed in a, in a session. So with a simple decorator, you get all the benefit that you used to have uh, in terms of performance and uh, uh, everything basically, uh, like using all your GPUs and stuff like that, uh, uh, that you used to have with the static graph, but we now need to write the, the code in a static way, in a descriptive, uh, uh, descriptive way, and then run it uh, <coughs> manually in a session. Now everything is done for you by, by this magic decorator. Uh, yesterday, uh, my, actually my, my boss, uh, which is Paolo Galeone, gave a talk on uh, dissecting uh, TF function. Uh, which you can find uh, probably when, uh, whenever the videos are uploaded or on the video by EuroPython or his blog. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, how to actually write idiomatic uh, TensorFlow 2 uh, code optimized for performance, you will uh, have to see his talk because it's go like uh, actually like dissect what the F function go does under the hood. So there's also the death of an API. Uh, so which API are dead now? Well, quite a lot. Uh, TF layer is dead. TF graph, as I told you, has gone into hiding, so you don't have to deal with the graph uh, explicitly anymore. And also, TF contrib has been completely killed. And it was about time, because I told you it was kind of a mess of a redundancy and uh, stuff like that. Uh, so, what we have now, now we have Keras. Long live Keras. Uh, what is Keras? Keras is actually is not a framework per se. Uh, Keras is actually a um, high-level API uh, spec uh, built with the usability in mind. Uh, in my opinion, sometimes it can feel a bit too magic uh, but we will see that there are ways uh, to go like, you know, skip the most of the high-level stuff and go uh, and, you know, put your end in the engine. Um, usually, at the beginning, uh, Keras had uh, three backend which were TensorFlow, CNTK, and Theano. So if you were writing code that respected the Keras API specification, you could 
uh, you used to be able to to run your uh, like your model with the multiple framework and backend. However, now uh, since CNTK has been deprecated very recently, Theano has been dead for like a, a year, maybe two years now. You're basically stuck with TensorFlow unless someone wants to actually create a PyTorch uh, backend for Keras, but I don't think anyone is working on it. I may be wrong. Uh, what Keras allows, Keras was uh, among we PyTorch the first um, one like API proposing the use of a really Pythonic object for what concerns layers <laughs> and models. And it also gives you uh, some like very high level magic way of training your model. Uh, they're actually pretty optimized, but uh, uh, they're not so customizable. It also gives you uh, a chainer API, which is called like that because the first framework uh, that introduced it was, was the chainer framework, which is built on top of QPy, which is like NumPy for CUDAs. Uh, this API, I will show you later, is uh, the like the expert mode API because it gives you basically all the flexibility you want, but it also comes with the, the caveat that uh, you may be uh, introducing bugs in your code. If you use the Keras way of defining model and running the training, you are pretty much guaranteed that there won't be bugs. Uh, or if there are bugs, they are not your bugs. They are actually like a problem in the library. Uh, you may look at the, up the, like the documentation on the Keras website, but I recommend actually, if you want to know the API, to not look at the one on Keras, but go look at the documentation on the TensorFlow site because it's done much better. Uh, one caveat, whenever you want to install Keras, uh, usually, uh, if you pip install Keras, you are actually not uh, getting the, the TensorFlow one, the one optimized for TensorFlow, but you're getting like the, the sort of like a generic library. So if you want to, to play with Keras, install TensorFlow and then use the package tf.keras. So uh, what is the, the basic block, uh, the basic building block of Keras? They are the Keras layers. This is one the, now in TensorFlow 2.0. This is the one and only layer API. Uh, gone are like the TF layers or TF.nnn uh, with the various operations. Now you get all everything inside TF layers, uh, TF Keras layers, uh, which is of course available on the TensorFlow Keras layers. Uh, what they are? They are Pythonic object, so they behave like same Python object. You you can do all the operation you're used to with with the Python object. If you want to inspect them, print them, uh, and everything, you, you can do it because they are now like sane Python object. Uh, they are very simple to use. They, they are like just a Python object, Python class. You initialize them and then every, basically, almost of the, this Keras object offers the, um, the ability to be used as callable. Uh, so once you have initialized them, then you simply call them on their input and they do all the stuff. Then we have Keras losses. Uh, now you don't get like the custom TF losses, everything like that. Everything lives under Keras losses. Again, Keras losses, uh, out of the box, they come with the most like used losses, but if you need to implement one yourself, they are pretty easy. You subclass the, uh, this TF Keras losses loss, uh, sort of like interface, which is like the, the basic parent for, for all the losses. And then in the call method, uh, you, you will simply, which is a, uh, which has a signature of uh, accepting two arguments, y true and y pred, which are data that will be fed when you call the losses. Uh, you simply define your, uh, you know, your computation, what you want to, the loss to, to do, and then you simply use the losses uh, uh, as if it were like one of the vanilla one. You also have Keras optimizer. There are no more uh, TensorFlow optimizer out of the box. You get the Keras one. Uh, if I remember correctly, I, I don't remember actually whether the TensorFlow one were like in the tf.optimizer or tf.train.optimizer, but now everything is gone. You have to use the tfkeras.optimizer. And, and again, if you want to maybe implement one custom optimizer, if you go to the website, the documentation will show you how to, uh, to do one. It's not that hard. So now we have the three different ways in which you can define a model. The three different ways are sequential, <coughs> functional, and subclass in API. We will look um, first at the sequential, because it's the, like, the, the most basic one. Sequential is pretty forward, straightforward. Uh, basically, it consists of a, a stacked sequence of, uh, of Keras layer, each feeding uh, into the, the next one in a linear way. So you don't get to have like, uh, uh, I don't know, like two layers feeding into one or like an additional um, like model which comes at a certain point in the computation. You will see later on that there is an API for that. So uh, everything is pretty simple. You get to instantiate this uh, sequential model 
and then you simply uh, you can either pass it like a list with all the, your your layers or iterative call the sequential dot uh, add the method <coughs> and uh, pass it the layer that you want. Here's an example. Uh, you see, we can either uh, use the TF Keras sequential as I told you with a list or we we add the layer one by one by calling the the doth method. However, while this is uh, this works really nice if you have a simple model, whenever you want to do something more complex, uh, it can be modeled in this way. So we, we get the functional API. The functional API has still the advantage of the sequential, which is uh, really straightforward to use. It's a bit more complicated, but uh, then again, uh, uh, in uh, comparison to the third API, which is a subclassing one, you still get the, uh, let's say, the the advantage that uh, you are not really introducing bug unless you do something strange with like input shape and stuff like that. So what is the functional API? Well, the functional API is uh, probably what um, I recommend using most of the time because uh, the sequential is uh, too simple unless you have to do something really <coughs> basic. You probably, your use case fall under the sequential API because you can model a lot of, of uh, complex model with, with the functional. Uh, what this does is that, um, uh, as I told you, Keras sequential is not enough to cover a vast portion of use cases. There are times when uh, a linear stack of, uh, of layers is not enough. In that moment, when we need to represent a more complex architecture, the Keras function API comes in. Uh, and it gives us a, a control on how the layer are uh, instantiated and called, and especially at which time. In the world of the documentation, <laughs> The functional API can handle model with non-linear topology, model with shared layers, and model with multiple inputs or outputs. It's based on the idea that a deep learning model is usually a direct acyclic graph, DAG, of layers. The functional API is a set of tools of building graphs of layer. Uh, what, uh, what, does it, um, what this means will be quite uh, easy to, to see when I show you the, the code example. So, before we, we start uh, doing everything in the sequential, we, we have to specify the uh, input shape that we're gonna give uh, uh, to our like model. Uh, we, are not, we never specify the batch size. The batch size is usually inferred by runtime. This is like a sort of good practice. If you want, there are ways to specify the batch size, but uh, you don't really need it. Uh, what's carefully turned is these uh, inputs, which uh, is like your first node of the graph you wanna build. After that, uh, you can see an example in the, in the box below. What we do is uh, we instantiate the model, which is the first set of parentheses, and once we, we have our uh, object model, we then call it uh, on um, the inputs that we want, and uh, after that, we use, uh, 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 for instance here, as you see, we have inputs, and then we have a bunch of uh, you know, computation, like uh, the, the first layer called the, the inputs, the second one called the previous layer, and then we have the outputs, which are basically called, of course, the previous one. Uh, once we have done it, we compile, like we, we package the model together using this uh, keras.model, uh, which is uh, uh, an object which uh, takes as input, uh, like uh, inputs, which is the list of the, of the nodes. If you have one, you can put a simple one. Otherwise, you, can, you may have like to, if you have multiple inputs node, then you have to specify multiple inputs nodes, so you pass a list of the Python variable that uh, contains that reference to the, the beginning node. And then you do the same thing for the output, so if you have a model with uh, know, like five different outputs, uh, then you pass a list with uh, all the Python variables that point to the, uh, this uh, output node. Once you have done it, uh, you get uh, a perfect Keras model, which is the same thing that you get out of the sequential one, uh, on it, you can call the method to, to inspect it, like model summary, which prints to the, uh, to the console, uh, like the structure, for instance, here is the summary of the model we have defined uh, in the previous slide. But Keras also supports some other way of inspecting your model, like you can save a, a graph feed, uh, dot, uh, dot language representation of your model, so it may be easier if you want to like, put it in, in your paper or in your documentation. There are many ways of uh, like seeing uh, what uh, your model, uh, uh, you know, the, the high level picture of everything you define it. Then we have the, the third way, which is uh, the, uh, let's, let's call it like that, the 1% way, because most of the time you won't be needing this one, which is the subclassing or chain API. The idea is very, very simple. You actually subclass the TF Keras model uh, class as a parent class. Then what you do is that uh, in your uh, init method, 
uh, you define all the layers, all the stuff that you will be using in the call method, which actually is the uh, forward pass of your model. So what, is, uh, what uh, this API allows you to do is that you get a perfect, a fine control of the forward pass because you actually are defining it yourself as you have to, to code it on your own. Uh, and you have to use everything you have defined, uh, of course, or all the layers that you have exposed, usually in the init. Uh, what this does is, however, that uh, since you actually are the one controlling the, the forward pass, you may uh, insert your own bug, because if you do some error in uh, the uh, like a disc description of the computation of the forward pass, it's on you. What the other two models uh, gives you is that uh, they come with this guarantee that uh, there won't be bug uh, read inserted by you in the forward pass. There will only be bug if they are present in of the library. But in this case, you may insert your own bug. So use the, the chain API at your own risk. Be aware that it is extremely powerful, but with power comes responsibility and technical depth. Uh, so this is an example of uh, how you will use the, uh, this uh, chain API. As you see, we simply uh, subclass the TF Keras. Uh, model, then we use a super to actually call the initialization of the Keras model uh, uh, parent class. And then after that, we, for instance, define stuff that uh, then we, we use uh, later in the code. So we, we add it to the, to the self property of the, of the class. So we can then call it. So it's really like normal object oriented way of, uh, let's say, use this uh, sort of model. Here we, we define our own forward pass. If we put some bug in here or some bug in here, then it's on us. Uh, together with uh, this API, then we have the TF data input pipeline story, which uh, is basically the same, so it doesn't uh, change a lot. Uh, what we get here is that now the TF dot data data set, which is uh, uh, this container for, for your data, uh, actually uh, you can uh, simply iterate on it uh, as if it were like a normal Python iterator. So before it, you have to instantiate uh, in 1.x, you had to do stuff like uh, initialize it, and then you have like uh, the iterator. You had a way, specific way of calling, which was not really intuitive. Now you get to, to use it as a simple uh, Python, uh, uh, Python iterator. What the, the TF data allow you, the, this data set, is that you can build it with the multiple source. Like you can either build it from stuff you have in memory, like tens you have in memory, or reading by disk, or by fetching a TF record file, which is the optimized uh, file type for, for your data in TensorFlow. After that, it allows you to, to build like even transformation pipeline, like maybe you, you have to do some pre-processing, and you can do it on the fly, because uh, one of the things that uh, TF data does is that you can easily parallelize your like input pipeline. And among other things, you can like prefetch your data. So whenever like your uh, GPU has finished the batch, they can uh, they already have like one uh, uh, one batch of your data in present in the uh, in the memory, and they can fetch it, and it goes really smoothly. Uh, here's uh, some additional information, but uh, we probably don't have uh, too much time. But uh, the idea is that uh, the uh, what what you can do is that you can either iterate it on the for loop, or you can call uh, each on it, and then consume it with the next function. So you, your mileage may, may vary on how you want to uh, to actually implement, uh, you know, and uh, implement your data set and consume it. Then we come to the model training, because it's the the, the finest part. Uh, whenever we, we work, we have two ways of uh, actually defining uh, using uh, uh, training Keras TensorFlow 2 model. We either go like full Keras, and going to full Keras, we get uh, again the advantage that we don't have to write our own training training loop, so we are not inserting bug into the training loop, and we get actually a lot of a lot of optimization uh, which are already done uh, by the, the Keras folk. Uh, but if we need to, we can have write, of course, our own training loop. A use case, a uh, very basic one, is uh, whenever you work with the GANs, uh, like generative adversarial network, uh, you will never use the, the Keras loop because uh, it's a mess to, to work with GANs, so you, you simply define your own. Uh, before you can train with Keras, you get to, to compile your model, which is basically uh, like assembling everything that you need to do the training. So you have your model on your mm, on one hand, then you have the uh, the TF data will come later on when uh, you actually you fit your model on your data. Uh, so what what goes into the compiler? You specify which optimizer you want. 
you specify the loss that you will use, and you also get the metrics that uh, you may want to print or optimize for. Sorry, you optimize for the losses, the metrics are simply something which uh, if you use also the correct callback stuff like that, they go into, for instance, tensor et etc. And also there are other options uh, which go into like <coughs> finer grain detail of your model, but uh, they are much my uh, higher level for, for the presentation. So is an example. You have your sec easy to use sequential model, then you call compile, and here we are actually optimizing for, for the loss, but we will also pre print in the metrics uh, of the accuracy. So you see it's a very simple to use. And uh, how do we fit? Well, we actually, how do we tell? We, we call the fit method. Uh, once you have a model compiled, you get to call the fit. The fit method is a function which accepts a lot of arguments, because there are a lot of ways in which you can train a, a model, like uh, uh, depending on if you want to do evaluation step, if you don't want to, or if you want to do evaluation on uh, steps or epochs or everything like that. So uh, here we go a simple, like a very high level overview. Oh, you need to specify your input data, which are x, your output data, which are the, your target data, which are the y's. Then uh, usually you specify the epochs. The, you can give the batch size, because uh, if you remember, as I told you, you don't, get to, you don't need to specify batch size. You can pass batch size when you call fit. And then if you want to, you can specify like validation data and your validation strategy. Uh, here's uh, uh, an example. Uh, we have the, this model, which uh, if I remember is the previous model. Uh, we, we use NumPy, we, we give some random data, and then we create like this uh, fake uh, val data. You can uh, give it uh, the, the data, you can pass them as a NumPy arrays, or if you want to, if you have them, you can use your tensorflow.dataset uh, uh, object. Exactly, uh, that's what uh, I was uh, arriving to. As you see here is an example of, of uh, how you would build uh, a pipeline with your data. For instance, here we are repeating stuff uh, because we, we want like the, uh, the generator to not get, uh, uh, you know, not finish the data we have in the hour iterator, but keep going and repeat them. And then we simply specify it on the, the fit uh, function. But then there's also the dark powers or the custom training. The custom training is uh, more complex because uh, as I told you, you get uh, outside the scope of these uh, pre-built stuff. Uh, what you have to do, or what you have to work for, is this gradient tape. The tape is basically a recording tape because uh, you open it with a normal Python scope, uh, so, sorry, context manager, and uh, once you are in it, uh, basically all the operation that you do will get registered into the uh, into the gradient tape, and then later on you will use this this oper this uh, computation uh, to actually compute your gradient and apply them uh, thanks to your optimizer, and basically you are actually <laughs> doing the training. So, but uh, how do, do, does this really work? Where uh, the code uh, is uh, longer, because actually it's mostly comment for, for your con consuming. So here is uh, what a, a simple uh, training loop would look like in a custom training scenario. Uh, we iterate, in this case, we, we go over the epoch in a normal Python iterator, uh, but then again, uh, as you see later on in the second uh, uh, iteration, we actually are consuming uh, these uh, uh, X batch train and Y batch train could be easily like fetched from a, an enumerate of the train data set because we want to keep track of the step. Then uh, the, the meat, like the, the, you know, the saucy part of the stuff is here when we have this uh, with tf dot gradient tape, we open it as a, the, the tape, and then here we do basically our forward pass. So we are getting, uh, we are registering all the operation of our forward, uh, uh, forward pass into the tape. What we do later on is that we, we actually get the gradient uh, that we need to apply from the, from the tape, and then thanks to the optimizer, we apply the gradients on the trainable weights of our model. So here, as you see, model.trainable weights gives you access to all the weights that are, are trainable uh, by your model, because you can set some of them as being like non-trainable, uh, and some of them are, of course, trainable. So once you, you have done it, there is an additional step here, which is not shown, which is uh, you have to delete the tape, if you want to, actually. Uh, here, the, the fact is that the tape can be, uh, you can have uh, any, any tape you want, any amount of tape you want, because maybe you do, for instance, if you are into in the GAN scenario, uh, you actually have like uh, uh, two tape, one for the schematic, one for the generator. 
Uh, you can add a like specified to different object tapes. So for instance, we will do something with the WTF gradient tape as a tape generator, WTF gradient tape as a, a tape discriminator, and then we use them uh, underneath, or uh, we simply pass the, a flag which is called persistent. Um, but the persistent basically allow you, whenever you want to have multiple tape for your model, you get to have just one, but then you have to remember to delete the tape uh, in, inside the training loop when you're done because you want the, the next iteration to have it like fresh. But this is more advanced and it's only whenever you want to have multiple tapes. I actually recommend to, personally I prefer to use like separate tapes, but uh, maybe if you really have a lot of them, then it comes really handy. Uh, once you have done it, then you can export it and exporting a model is very simple. You have this uh, model.save, once a model is, an object model is trained. And uh, there are many ways in which you can export a model. You can export a model as a HD5 Keras uh, blob, uh, but you can also export it in the saved model, uh, which is the, the same saved model format optimized for, for production that you, you were used to in uh, TensorFlow 1.x. And you can also uh, save only the, the weights of your model. So to conclude, uh, if, you were, if you are right now using 10, 10 PyTorch, because you like it, uh, you like the eager mode and everything, give TensorFlow 2.0 a try, because it actually has become really much easier to use, and you also get all the benefits of deploying to mobile, which has only recently been added to, to PyTorch and is still in experimental phase, and also, oh sorry, I guess time is ending. Uh, <laughs> And you also get to everything that you, you, you can basically put your model in production at scale in, with all the cloud provider. Because uh, even though they are now supporting more and more PyTorch, whenever you want to deploy TensorFlow, it's much easier. You also get the benefit of the whole uh, TF.x uh, TensorFlow extended ecosystem, which is a, a vast array of libraries, um, sometimes often by Google, but most of the time even by either uh, other companies and stuff like that, which extend on top of the, the TensorFlow library. And then again, if you like Keras, give TensorFlow a try, and uh, if TensorFlow 1.x scared you away, then give again TensorFlow a try. So a happy PyCon, follow me on Twitter, and thanks for, for everything. <laughs>